There is not a single medium that has evolved as much and as rapidly as video games. Almost every year, there are incredible breakthroughs that change the course of gaming as a whole, and this ever-expanding trajectory creates a dissonance that is so great, it causes people to refuse the very thought of comparison. But this idea is fundamentally flawed. Comparison is a crucial component of not only learning, but also developing opinions and thoughts on a certain experience. A person who has only seen one movie in their entire life can't explain their thoughts on the best movie ever made, as they don't have a concept of what movies as a whole really are. And I think that this is the generally accepted idea in almost everything people consume. But for video games, we have created an environment where it seems crazy to entertain the idea that games are comparable. Of course, people do make statements about games that are rooted in the idea of comparison. But the way people reach these conclusions is not actually through any method that compares and contrasts the game itself. This is incredibly prevalent in the ongoing debates as to whether or not retro games are still good. There seems to be this idea that the answer is yes or no, that retro games are obviously worse because they are older, or that newer games are worse because they aren't the classics. To say a game like Red Dead Redemption is better than Yoshi's Island is not a crazy thing to say, and yet I made no true comparison between these titles. But what's even more interesting is that if I were to tell you that Red Dead Redemption could learn from Yoshi's Island, you would most likely disregard any point I would try to make because the accepted idea is how could you possibly compare these two titles? And these two games are only 15 years apart. Of course, the graphical difference between these two games can cause people to take these statements at face value, and because of that, you can actually see this ideology break down in real time. For example, these two games are also 15 years apart, and suddenly, the lines are a lot more blurry. This realization has started to affect the way I look at games. It has become a lot harder for me to say that one game is definitively better than another, and I have started to wonder how far this idea can be pushed when taken seriously. So, as a challenge to myself and game design as a whole, I pose the question, can an arcade game teach modern games to be better? And even more extreme, can an arcade game truly be better than one that comes out today? Now, many problems arise when trying to tackle these types of questions, especially when it comes to games that were made in the arcade era. This is in large part due to the fact that the idea of game design didn't exist in the way it does today. Now, the term game design refers to designing the blueprints for the rules, systems, and mechanics to change the experience the player has. But back in the 70s and 80s, the term was mostly interchangeable with game development. Game development refers to the act of creating said rules, systems, and mechanics. Now, this isn't to say that designers weren't focused on the player's experience, just that it was seen as part of the development process and not its own idea. For example, Space Invaders was designed to be a worthy contender to the incredible hit Breakout, and was also designed to be a shooter, as developer Tomohiro Nishikado was most comfortable with that genre. Galaxian was created with the goal of making the game feel like the big space battles from Star Wars, and Pac-Man was created with the goal of appealing to the general public, not just people who are already familiar with arcade games. Reaching these goals was done mostly by trial and error in the development process, not by figuring out the how and why certain mechanics interacted with each other in the design process. This would be the case for a long time. In fact, it wasn't until 1984 that the first book on game design would be published. The Art of Computer Game Design by Chris Cross Crawford is recognized as the first book that started to explore the ideas we think of today. This book is not focused on the implementation side of games, nor is it focused on any one game mechanic. Instead, this book proposes the idea of trying to figure out and accomplish the goals of your game. From then, game design continued to evolve, and as games got more advanced, learning about the topic became easier and easier. But how can we take a look at game design from the arcade era if it wasn't taught or acknowledged in the ways it is today? Well, what we can do is try to reverse engineer the design of these old games. As I said before, the game designers did have goals in mind when creating these classic titles. The only difference is that not too much time was spent on analyzing the how and why these designs worked. By taking a look at what these games were trying to accomplish, we can reverse engineer the design principles that made these titles so great. Luckily for us, these games all tended to have the same ideas, because every arcade game's success was based on the number of quarters spent on its machine, and when you design with this idea in mind, you create a few inherent goals. For starters, each arcade game had the goal of appealing to as many people as possible. Obviously, the bigger the fan base is for a specific game directly correlates with the amount of quarters a game can receive. Secondly, arcade games are built to be difficult, but addictive. 
This serves two main purposes. One is that if an arcade game is difficult, then more people get to play within a specific amount of time. And two is that if a game is addictive, people will be more likely to play over and over, spending more and more as time goes on. And the last main goal of an arcade game has to do with their memorability. If a game is more memorable or recognizable, it is easier to get your game to spread between people, which increases the amount of chances you get to make an impression on a new player. And now, when we take these few generic arcade game goals, we can then figure out why certain design aspects worked for these older games. In 1976, Nolan Bushnell and Steve Bristow tasked the then 26-year-old engineer Steve Wozniak to create an arcade game known as Breakout. Steve's task was to take the concept given to him and find some way to reduce the amount of chips the game required. Steve Wozniak was able to reduce the amount from an average of 200 logic chips down to a staggering 45 in only 4 days. Not only did this dramatically reduce the cost for each arcade cabinet, but in the act of boiling the game down to the point where it could achieve this impossible goal, one of the most fundamental design aspects was made integral to this title. Simplicity, although usually thought of nothing more than just a description of an experience or idea, is a design aspect that almost perfectly builds towards the general goals of each arcade game. Simplicity creates an environment that anyone can understand, which widens the demographic that would be willing to play your game. As the bricks on the screen slowly deplete, your ability to destroy the desired blocks becomes more and more difficult, and because of the simplistic nature of this game, the player is always aware of what they could do to improve, which creates a subconscious desire to try again. And of course, it's always easier for something simple to stick in your head. As well, it's easier to explain a simple idea to your friends or family, which creates a situation where the game could easily spread among more people. The idea of simplicity being a design aspect makes reaching these goals almost inevitable, and the fact that the limitations of the time force this idea on every game is why so many titles were able to reach these goals. But simplicity is far from the only integral design aspect. In 1978, Tomohiro Nishikado created a game that would define the entire arcade era. Space Invaders, the alien space shooter, was not only a technical marvel, but a design pioneer as well. The game was a software-based program that ran on a microcomputer, something new to Japan that didn't even have the optimal tools for development, which forced Nishikado to create his own. After going through a few different iterations, the game we know and love today was formed, but this game had an interesting glitch or bug that created an unforeseen design aspect. Each frame, if you will, would draw each one of the iconic aliens individually, which was limited in speed due to the hardware, but as enemies were shot and killed, the amount to draw became fewer and fewer. This in turn caused the game to speed up in real time as the player got farther into the level, and this aspect created a sense of strategy that was fundamental to the design. Defeating enemies row by row instead of column by column would ensure that you had more time to clear the board, but shooting in quick succession and allowing multiple enemies to die in a column was easier than carefully picking off the bottom row. This aspect of strategy was another perfect example of a game being difficult but addictive. As a player realizes there might be a better way to accomplish their goal, they again subconsciously entertain the idea of trying again. Of course, the game was an enormous success, even spawning urban legends of 100 yen coin shortages in Japan, and due to this success, we got yet another game that utilized an incredible design aspect in a unique way. In 1979, Namco would create a response to the iconic Space Invaders in the form of Galaxian. Inspired by the instant classic Star Wars, Galaxian aimed to recreate the feeling of the intense space battles seen in the film. Shooting enemies, dodging and weaving bullets from all angles, and most importantly, dodging the swooping ships flying towards you at full speed were all aspects made to capture the feeling of the popular movie. But these mechanics created one of the strongest feelings of skill curve ever seen. No more are you as focused on the order you kill each enemy, but your ability to bob and weave the oncoming onslaught of bullets and ships. This feeling of your skill always improving reinforced the idea that if you play again, you do better. And of course, this increased the competitiveness in ways that weren't as prevalent before. These three pillars of design, that being simplicity, strategy, and skill, continued to evolve and be used in better ways. Pac-Man was a game that was made to appeal to more people than ever before, and the combination of strategy, skill, and simplicity was used almost perfectly. Donkey Kong was a game that used recognizable characters to make some of the most memorable characters in gaming history, and Galaga, the sequel to Galaxian, would continue to evolve and perfect the feeling of skillful gameplay from its predecessors. But these games are primitive compared to what we know and love today, which begs the question, are these concepts even useful or apparent in modern games today? Well, that is going to depend on the type of game. 
If a game is designed to be played over and over, it will automatically align with a lot of the goals of classic arcade games. Some obvious examples of this include racing games, sports games, and fighting games, but these are far from the only genres that are rooted in arcade design. Battle Royale and shooter games are also designed to be played over and over. They rely heavily on the idea that the player will want to improve their skill, and they put emphasis on making sure the player knows how they can improve. But video games no longer have to focus on making people play over and over. In fact, most video games have completely changed the script and started focusing on making players play for longer. This is the case for many, many reasons, but for one, people today buy and keep their video games. The developers don't have to bring you back in, you have already fulfilled their goal. The only problem is that players have to feel like their money was well spent. $60 to play Spider-Man needs to feel just as warranted as spending 25 cents to play Pac-Man, and this is a hard metric to gauge. Do players place value on the amount of fun a title has, or do they base it on the amount of different stuff they are able to do? Either way, making a game longer gives you more chances to make the player feel satisfied. Whether or not this philosophy makes sense is up for debate, but the question is do these games contain arcade aspects even when they're fundamentally built on different ideas? To start, let's look at the most different genre we can. Open world games are built around the idea of exploration, progression, and experimentation, and these ideas are almost completely absent in arcade games. Of course, exploration relies on the idea of there being enough to explore, which is impossible to implement if your game puts all it has to offer out from the get-go. Progression is something that you might think is integrated into arcade games because of the difficulty curve, but the game isn't actually progressing in any way. In Galaga, the levels get more and more difficult as time goes on, but nothing new is truly apparent to the player and if you die, any vague sense of progression is thrown out the window. And of course, experimentation is reliant on the mechanics of your game having almost hidden uses or reactions. This is almost apparent in a few arcade titles, but for the most part, because all information is made immediately apparent to the player, in arcade games there is almost no room for experimentation, there is no room for progression, and there is no room for exploration. But even while open world games are built on different ideas and formed around concepts that couldn't exist in the past, they still rely on ideas that are viewed as archaic. While the goal of these games is not built around the idea of playing the entire experience over and over, they are built around repeating a gameplay loop. In Skyrim, the player accepts quests, explores as a result of those quests, increases skills and abilities throughout exploration, and in turn, discovers new quests. And it's impossible not to make the connection between a successful gameplay loop and a successful arcade game, as the entire point is to get the player to want to do something repetitively. As well, this is accomplished by using some of the design aspects from arcade games. Now, defining simplicity can be a bit difficult to do as games evolve because they continue to get more advanced as time goes on, but it's important to remember that players also evolve as time goes on. As video games get more and more complicated, gamers' baseline of knowledge becomes more advanced, and as a result, complications don't come from not knowing the controls or not understanding how a video game works. Everyone who plays games already knows how a basic controller works. They know that you use the mouse to look around and the keyboard to move, and they understand how game mechanics usually interact with each other. Today, everyone knows A is to jump, while back when Pac-Man was in its prime, the idea of jumping in a video game didn't exist. Because of this, simplicity is found in different ways. For example, Skyrim uses simplicity to make each mission feel more memorable. Each mission not only has simple objectives such as talk to Girder in Riverwood or give Malborn the equipment, but the entire goal of each mission is usually able to be summed up in a matter of three words or less. You know which mission I mean when I say remember the Bleak Falls Barrow mission or remember the Shout mission, and that's because Skyrim makes sure that the story aspects are simple and easy to follow. The game, although massive and extremely extraordinarily in-depth, offers a simplistic and easy-to-follow narrative that allows players to easily connect and spread the game throughout friend groups. And there are many more ways that Skyrim uses simplicity to its advantage, such as the easy-to-follow combat mechanics or the objective points within the minimap. But for now, let's take a look at a different example. Strategy is a concept that can be found in almost every game, but what I'm really referring to is the ability for multiple players to have different methods of play. In games like Rocket League, strategy is obviously apparent, but the general thought process is the same between most players. This title comes down to being able to pull off certain mechanics instead of deciding how to go about meeting your objective. Again, strategy is a huge part of this title, but it generally aligns more with the skill aspect instead of strategy. And like I said earlier, Space Invaders is a good example of a game that implemented strategy within its gameplay. 
Players could choose to take out enemies in the easier and faster way, which would in turn make the game substantially harder as time went on. Or they could choose to take enemies out slowly and methodically to keep the game's difficulty more even as the time continued. The gameplay, although had an element of skill, was not focused on improving your abilities like Rocket League. It was a game that allowed you to strategize in different ways. And in the modern era, this is seen in a lot of different games. Of course, you have games that are entirely built off strategizing effectively, such as the Civilization series and Oxygen Not Included. But this aspect can also be seen in some open world games. My favorite example of this aspect has to be the Assassin's Creed games. These games revolve around the idea that you can tackle missions in a multitude of ways, and the gameplay allows for the player to come up with different working strategies. You can choose to carefully take out each and every guard in your path without ever making your presence known, or you can charge ahead and destroy everything in your path. Both of these options have their benefits, and the game encourages the player to experiment with both of these strategies as well as many others. These specific aspects can also be seen in games like Spider-Man and the Thief series, but it should be noted that stealth games are not the only time we see these kinds of things. To use Skyrim for another example, we can see this type of strategy in the skill trees the game has to offer. These upgrades allow the player to choose different playstyles and strategize how they want to go about playing the game. You can choose to upgrade your giant two-handed weapons and take out enemies with one swing. You can choose to battle with spells learned from the books scattered across the land, and you can choose to swiftly shield bash and slay enemies with your short sword or be a stealth archer. The point is, the aspect of strategy can be seen in many, many titles, not just from the arcades, but the modern era as well. And lastly, I want to take a look at skill. Skill is again an aspect apparent in every game, but that's not exactly all I'm referring to. When I say skill, I'm referring to the idea that the player is able to improve their skill and knows how. Also, I'm referring to the idea that improving said skills does not stem from strategizing better, as that of course would align more with strategy. Galaga, an example I used before, is a game that allows the player to improve and makes it easy to know how. By dodging right too soon and dying, you know to wait a little longer next time. An open world game that displays this idea is a game like Bloodborne. The entire point of this game is to have a difficulty curve that feels punishing but rewards players for improving their skill levels, and the Dark Souls series, although not as open as a game like Bloodborne, is another example of modern games using the idea of skill-based gameplay to keep players wanting more. And as I said before, games like Rocket League are also focused around the idea of improving your skill. You need to fully understand and be able to effectively pull off certain moves or abilities, and that knowledge of I can do better encourages the player to play for longer periods of time. Shooter games and battle royale games are also games that use this aspect, and they take it to the extreme. Today we have esports, which solidifies the idea that you can get better and improve your skill. There would be no best Rocket League player if skill wasn't as fundamental to the game's design. One thing I do want to mention is that you can push the boundary of strategy game to the point that it becomes a skill-based experience. For example, a game like Tetris back on the NES is built around the idea of improving your strategy. Things like where to place blocks and how to prepare for the future are both aspects of strategy, but today, players have pushed the boundaries so far that it becomes a game of precision, fast thinking, and dexterity. This isn't really important to the design of these games, but I thought it was an interesting thing to note considering you don't really see these sorts of games in the esports space. Although, if there was a grip extreme tournament for Roller Coaster Tycoon, I would be first in line to see that. Anyways, all in all, the fact that we can still see these aspects in modern games shows that we can compare and contrast between the two. But does that mean modern games can learn from arcade games to be better? Tackling this idea comes with many of its own problems, but for now, let's operate under the idea that any game is comparable with another. For starters, let's look at the design aspect of simplicity throughout gaming. As I've said, games that use this aspect aim for a memorable experience and for the player to always know what's going on. Just because games are more complicated today, doesn't necessarily mean that they are utilizing this aspect worse, as this idea can be found in many different ways. Instead, for a game to be utilizing these aspects worse or better, we have to look at how well these games achieve their goals. For starters, let's look at a game like Dark Souls. Dark Souls is a game that is built off difficult and complicated fighting mechanics. Pulling off your abilities and pulling them off well results in progression, but because the fighting is so complicated and each enemy is entirely different, the player has a hard time understanding what they did wrong. The original Dark Souls is known for being clunky and unfair, which leaves a lot of players with a bad taste in their mouth. This is greatly due to the fact that the game doesn't properly utilize the aspect of simplicity. You can see proof of this in the fact that the players who continued to play, the ones who chose to power through and understand, ended up loving this game and 
and franchise. Once you understand the mechanics of the game, there is a baseline of simplicity for you to rely on. Now, games don't necessarily need to simplify their mechanics to allow the player to better understand. In fact, if a game like Dark Souls removed these complicated aspects from the game, I and millions of other people would like it less. But there is something to learn from the classic arcade titles. In the older games, you knew what you did wrong and how to improve. In Dark Souls, you may not understand what you did wrong because the mechanics were still foreign to you. In order to know what you did wrong, you have to know what you should have done instead. If Dark Souls delivered its mechanics to the player in a more direct way, players would have a better understanding of what they were doing, and the game wouldn't feel as unfair. Now, the concept of better tutorials has already been talked about to death, so I won't go into much detail on it here. But it's important to know that a well-made tutorial can create a baseline of simplicity to a complicated game. Next, we have the concept of strategy. Now, this doesn't necessarily only have to do with allowing strategy to be present in your game. Instead, it has to do with allowing the player to know that different strategies are available. For example, in Dig Dug, as soon as you play the game, you see how enemies interact. You immediately have an understanding that defeating enemies in a certain order will have an effect on your gameplay. But there are many modern games that allow for strategy and don't actually give the player a clear reason to try or let the player know that it exists in the first place. Again, I'm going to use Skyrim as an example. Skyrim allows for making your own potions, crafting your own weapons, and even purchasing houses to make your experience easier. Each of these mechanics has its own strategies and gives the player multiple ways to complete certain objectives. The only problem is that the game doesn't make the player aware of these alternate strategies, at least in a noticeable way. I have seen thousands of people not even know that you can make potions that aren't found in the general land of Skyrim, and I have seen a ton of people confused as to why someone would make a weapon instead of go search for another one. In the arcade era, you wouldn't be confused as to why someone would use a different strategy, because each one had its own merits. But today, even in the best of games, people will usually throw out certain parts of the game because there seems to be no point. By giving the player incentives to use all types of strategies within a game, you create a situation where different types of people will want to try different methods and not feel like they are being punished or at a disadvantage because of it. In Skyrim, the player will come across a blacksmithing area at the first town they visit, but if they properly looted equipment during the first mission, there is no item that you can craft better than what you already have. There is no reason, no point, no gain, and so, strategy is lost. And lastly, we have the concept of skill. Now, as I said before, the player always has to be aware of how to improve their skill. But what is even more important is that a game gives them a reason to improve their skill. In a game like Donkey Kong, the game is always getting more difficult, and so, the player always feels as though there is a benefit to improving. But in a game like Left 4 Dead 2, the game feels as though it's the same difficulty throughout, which tricks you into thinking it's getting easier. This is an interesting example because I feel as though Left 4 Dead is incredibly rooted in arcade design, and yet, because the difficulty curve is off, it makes it feel like the replayability factor is held back. This of course is purely an issue of balance, and balancing problems are apparent in almost every game today. Nailing a difficulty curve is a hard thing to do, and because modern games don't have to get it perfect, it creates some subpar results. Survival games sometimes have an issue when it comes to this, as there is a ceiling to the difficulty level far below the ceiling of your power level. For example, to beat Minecraft, you have to get armor, travel to the nether, obtain blaze rods, ender pearls, find the stronghold, and hope you can kill the dragon. After this, the difficulty completely drops off, and your ability to get stronger doesn't. You can get an elytra, upgrade to netherite, and obtain a beacon through a boss that is easy after everything you have done, and finally, you can create a beacon that practically makes you immortal. The fact that the difficulty curve stops scaling with the player's power creates a feeling of pointlessness that is difficult for people to get past. Now, I'm not going to propose a fix to this problem as this aspect doesn't necessarily align with the goals of Minecraft. It is meant to be relaxing, so there is no problem with the fact that it is. I only wanted to highlight how not using the skill aspect properly can affect how people view your game, and that idea is incredibly important to mention. Like I've been saying this entire time, game design is the idea of using aspects to complete your goal as a designer. Applying some arcade design aspects to something like Skyrim's potion mechanics might be able to improve the experience, but applying those same aspects to a game like Minecraft could in turn make the design worse. 
This is something that people seem to miss on both sides of this idea. People who say new games would be better if they were designed like old games, and people who say old games would be better if they were designed like new games, are both missing the fact that these games had completely different goals. There is a kind of all-or-nothing thought process when it comes to the idea behind using mechanics from other games. For example, I have heard a lot of people say stuff like arcade games were better because you could game over, or because they had timers. And the point they are trying to make is that if new games added timers or game overs, they would be better. But today, there is no reason to try and make the players stop playing or restart. Players have already bought the game. 2D platformers used to have timers to ensure that more people got a chance to play. But today, that isn't necessary. That's not the goal, and it makes no sense for it to be. The idea behind modern fighting games, beat-em-ups, racing games, and even shoot-em-ups is that they are not designed as well because they don't focus on exactly what the classic titles had to. And if the discussion was based on what you personally thought was more fun, that would be one thing. But the discussion that people seem to want is why games are designed better or worse. Again, how well a game is designed has to do with how well a game achieves that specific game's goal. Arcade aspects can be used to improve a newer game, but they can also be damaging. The idea that arcade games were difficult, so we must make games super difficult today in order for them to be good, is a flawed one. Arcade games were not designed to be obscenely difficult, whether you like it or not. They were designed to be difficult enough to keep the player wanting more, and if we design a game around just being difficult with without focusing on what makes difficult games work, then we end up with an unfair or unplayable experience. Interestingly enough, while I was researching this topic, a thought popped into my head. One that is slightly terrifying, but warrants some thought. Games that are designed exactly like old arcade games do exist today, and their design is almost perfect because of the goal they have. Today, arcade games take the shape of mobile games. They are difficult, but addictive. They have elements of skill and strategy. You remember almost every single one through a five-second ad on social media, and their goal is to get you to play just one more time. All in all, the point of this idea is that it is important to allow the discussion of comparison when it comes to how well games are designed. I cannot confidently say that Skyrim is better than Tetris, as Tetris was almost perfectly designed to achieve a goal. And I cannot say that Tetris is better than Skyrim, as Skyrim successfully built off the games of the past. But what I can say is that Skyrim could learn a thing or two about design from Tetris, and Tetris could learn a thing or two from Skyrim. Huge thanks to my patrons on screen now.